just like to welcome you all tonight. We have a really wonderful guest, Sanbury Licks Katz, who um, has come tonight to talk about his new book, The Art of Fermentation, but also a couple of other interesting issues. Before we start, I just want to give a really big thanks to Man Library for providing this space to us and all of the work that the New World Agriculture and Ecology Group has done to plan both this event and several other events in Ithaca. I'd also like to thank the Graduate and Professional Student Assembly for funding Sandor's visit here. So thanks has to go to that. Um, I'm also just really pleased to introduce Sandor Katz. He's a self-taught fermentation experimentalist. And he wrote this book, Wild Fermentation, The Flavor, Nutrition, and Craft of Live Culture Foods, in 2003, which Newsweek called the Fermenting Bible. <laughs> and it's interesting, a lot of people were introduced to their home fermentation projects just by reading a couple of recipes in this book. But it's not just the recipes, it's also the stories and the history that go along with why people would make things in their home as opposed to buying them at a store, or why they would buy things in a store as a complement to other nutritional and dietary aspects of their lifestyle. So um, Sandra wrote this book in order to share his fermentation wisdom that he had learned and demystify home fermentation. And since its publication in 2003, Katz has taught hundreds of fermentation workshops across North America and beyond, and taking on a role that he describes as a fermentation revivalist, or a cultural revivalist. Now, in The Art of Fermentation, his new book, with a decade more experience behind him, the unique opportunity to hear countless stories about fermentation practices and answering thousands of troubleshooting questions, he's sharing a more in-depth exploration of the topic. So Sandor Kraut has also authored this book, The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved, Inside America's Underground Food Movements. He wrote it, in, it was published in 2006, and at that point I met Sandor in California when I invited him to Mills College, where I was an undergrad, and he did a kimchi workshop and a talk about food activism. So tonight our talk is going to be about food activism as a liaison with fermentation. Um, we hope that this series of talks that Sandra has done in Ithaca will inspire future collaborations and celebrations of fermentation in Tompkins County, because we actually have a ton of cultural revivalists right here in Tompkins County, doing various fermented foods, pickling, beverages, all sorts of foods that preserve not only the food itself, but our food culture. So I really encourage everyone to take a look at this table on the right hand side, maybe after the talk, after our question and answer, um, because there's more information there about ways to plug into fermentation right here in Tompkins County, including a new website slash blog where you can send in stories about foods that you've fermented or interests that you have in other foods. It's called Find Your Ferment, and it's at the Cayuga Street Kitchen blog. So please check that out. Um, but really, this talk is, is meant to be a starter culture for a larger movement that we see happening in Ithaca. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sandor Alex Cat. All right. Well, um, uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Shoshi, for um, for that introduction and for organizing all of this and the rest of the uh, uh, group that you got involved in, in in organizing all these events. And thank you all for coming out today. It's a special honor for me to be here at Cornell University for two different reasons. Um, one is that my father graduated from Cornell University in 1955 and actually people the last few days have been asking me what he studied here and I didn't even know but I called him this afternoon um, to ask him what his major was when, when he went to college here and uh, he was a political science major. Um, and the other reason why it's special for me to be at Cornell University is that you know the most comprehensive book that has been written about um, 
the topic of fermentation in the English language was um, you know, edited by a Cornell food science professor um, who, who has passed on, Keith Steinkraus. Um, and so you know, that, his book, um, The Handbook of Indigenous Fermentation Processes, has been um, you know, just an indispensable research for me in my, um, in my, uh, in my research. Um, so it's, uh, it's really an honor to be, to be here at Cornell. Now, you know, mostly what I do is I teach people how to, ma how to make sauerkraut. And um, I, I have to say that I feel a little bit naked standing in front of a group of people without a knife and a cutting board and a head of cabbage. Um, and you know, really, like what I, what, 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 what what I love doing more than anything else is just you know sharing uh, you know like skills, and that's that that that's what my uh, you know that's what my books are really um, um, all about. Um, but I want to um, I want to use this time here today, and I, I don't want to talk for too long because it's really you know it's more fun for you and more fun for me if uh, you know we have more of an interactive exchange. But there's you know sort of like three big um, sort of you know themes that uh, you know I've been I've been thinking about um, in, in in relation to, uh, to, to 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 fermentation and uh, you know one I would say is evolution one is culture and one is community so I'm gonna sort of you know try to um, um, you know sort of you know, briefly address um, you know fermentation as it relates to you know sort of each of each of these three you know huge broad themes um, so so let, let me start with with with, with evolution um, there's a huge amount of speculative literature that or uh, that, that that you know theorizes about the idea, you know, how did humans invent fermentation? You know, um, um, you know how did people, uh, you know, figure out how to make alcohol? Um, and, you know, humans did not invent fermentation. It would be far more accurate to turn it around and say that fermentation invented humans. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know, maybe we have some creationists in the room, but, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you subscribe to the theory of evolution, you know, all life is descended from bacteria. Um, you know, it seems like the, the, the emerging idea is that, um, you know, it, it, it was a symbiosis between fermenting bacteria and other early microorganisms, um, um, uh, you know, gave rise to the first eukaryotic cells. The, um, um, you know, cells, uh, you know, of which, um, uh, you know, animals, plants, and fungi are composed. Um, and so, you know, the corollary to the idea that all life is evolved from bacteria is that no life has ever lived without bacteria. So, you know, in our own human bodies, you know, bacteria are absolutely essential, you know. Um, you know, despite the sort of, um, uh, you know, cultural indoctrination that all of us have received that bacteria are bad, bacteria are dangerous, we want to kill all the bacteria, you know, we want to buy soaps that promise to kill 99.9% .9 of bacteria, um, you know, it is not really desirable for us to kill all the bacteria. We couldn't survive without bacteria. Um, you know, bacteria play, um, you know, all sorts of essential, uh, uh, you know, roles in our, in our physiology and, and our functioning. B bacteria synthesize nutrients that are uh, essential to us. Um, you know, bacteria enable us to digest nutrients that we wouldn't otherwise be able to digest. Uh, uh, bacteria, um, you know, make nutrients bioavailable to us. Um, bacteria protect us from the, you know, really fairly limited number of bacteria that have the potential to make us sick. Um, um, you know, and you know, there's just all of this sort of emerging information about all of the ways in which our gut bacteria um, uh, uh, mediate other, you know, immune responses and other kinds of um, um, uh, uh, physiological processes. I mean, recently there was a, um, a, a, a an exciting new report that that, that found that um, uh, you know, when a person fights a lung infection, it's actually gut bacteria that are you know, mediating that, that immune response. So you know, clearly, um, uh, you know, bacteria are, are you know, very important um, um, you know, to, to human beings and really to, to all um, animals. 
Now, thinking about plants, you know, plants are no less dependent upon bacteria than we are. And so, um, you know, so no plant lives in a sterile environment. There is no sterile environment other than, um, um, you know, ones created through, um, um, you know, uh, extraordinary means in, you know, in university campuses and government, and, and, and government facilities. But, you know, everywhere else, you know, there's, there's just all sorts of microorganisms. There's also no such thing as singular microorganisms. You never find, you know, a single species of bacteria, a, 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 a single species of mold, like they just don't exist in the natural world. Um, so, so, so anyway, um, um, you know, thinking about um, you know plants and bacteria, and then humans harvesting plants to eat them. We're never just eating the plants; we're eating the plants and the bacteria. And um, and then, especially once we start thinking about how to store food. Um, you know, as, as human beings, um, you know, sort of slowly um, uh, moved from, uh, you know, migratory hunter-gatherer societies where, where each day um, um, you know, people were engaged in procuring the food resources to get them through that day, you know, once people started thinking about storing food, you know, it just becomes all about how do you work with the bacteria? Um, you know, how do you dry food effectively so that it prevents bacteria from, um, from, from consuming the dead plant material that, that you're going to eat? Um, um, uh, you know, people, you know, just inevitably observed, you know, under different types of storage conditions, different things happened to their food. Um, you know, so for instance, you know, just picturing a, you know, a, a contemporary vegetable ahead of cabbage, you know, if you take a, 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 a piece of cabbage and leave it on your kitchen counter, you know, you could leave it there for two days, you could leave it there for two weeks, you could leave it there for two months, you could leave it there for two years, and it is never going to turn itself into sauerkraut. There are a multitude of different types of organisms on that head of cabbage. Um, if you leave it just sitting on the counter exposed to air, what's going to happen, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room who's ever had an experience like this, is you'll get dark colored molds growing on the cabbage, and if it's hot enough, if it's humid enough, if you, you know, had the poor judgment to leave it on the counter wrapped in plastic, um, you know, that, 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 that mold could literally reduce a head of cabbage into a puddle of slime. And the puddle of slime, you know, bears no resemblance whatsoever to delicious, crunchy, tangy sauerkraut. And so if a vegetable is exposed to air, molds are what are going to become dominant on that every single time. If, on the other hand, you manage to submerge the cabbage under liquid, Liquid, then the molds can't grow because they don't have access to oxygen. And so what's going to grow instead are lactic acid bacteria. And the lactic acid bacteria are going to give it a nice, uh, a nice tangy flavor. And then they're going to make it impossible for any of the bacteria that we would regard as pathogenic bacteria to, um, um, uh, to remain alive, even if they were present on the cabbage in the first place. Um, and, and by the way, the most... Um, um, the, the, the bacteria that creates a toxin which is considered the, the, the substance most toxic to humans of any other um, substance, um, Clostridium botulinum, that produces a toxin that we know as botulism, it's pretty, it's, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a common soil bacteria. It's everywhere, and it probably is present on every head of cabbage. But the only the only environmental condition in which Clostridium botulinum, uh, you know, ever has the possibility of um, proliferating and creating that toxin is, you know, if you heat it up to the point where you kill all the other bacteria. One of the things that distinguishes Clostridium botulinum is that it has the sporulating form that. Um, 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 is, is extremely heat resistant and it can even resist boiling temperatures. And so that's why in canning it's important to pressure cook things because you, you, you elevate the temperature even higher than boiling and you have to hold it there for a certain amount of time in order to kill all the Clostridium botulinum because um, you know if you manage to kill all the other bacteria, you don't have to worry about this in the fermentation um, um, context at all because the lactic acid bacteria are so much um, uh, more prevalent in every single time 
time you, you submerge uh, cabbages un underwater, they will, um, uh, uh, they're what, what will dominate, and as they acidify the environment, they'll kill off the Clostridium botulinum that, that might be present. The only time it ever has the opportunity to develop is in improperly heated canned foods. So if you can something, heat it to the point where everything else dies, the lactic acid bacteria dies, the mold spores die, the only thing that survives is Clostridium botulinum, and you've left it in this perfect vacuum, the perfect anaerobic environment that it needs in order to proliferate, then the Clostridium botulinum grows. And the only reason we all know the word botulism is because, um, uh, uh, you know, in the, um, in the context of canning, which was, you know, invented like almost exactly 200 years ago, a, French man, a Frenchman named Nicolas Appert, um, um, you know, invented the process for, um, uh, you know, canning sterilization. Um, uh, and so, you know, during the 19th and early 20th century, there were all of these, um, you know, like scandalous stories where entire families died eating a, you know, a, a jar of, um, you know, canned string beans or, or, or whatever that hadn't been subjected to quite enough heat. Um, and uh, anyway, I mean, this is just to illustrate that, you know, on every, you know, on, on all plant matter, there is a multitude of microorganisms, not just a single one. And there is sort of... Um, there's an inevitability of our having to um, deal with these organisms. You know, I mean, fermentation or, or microbial transformations, because uh, you know, fermentation specifically describes um, uh, anaerobic organisms, um, um, and and there are anaerobic as well as as aerobic organisms on on on, on everything. Um, but um, you know, microbial transformations of our food are an inevitability. And so, you know, either our food decomposes into forms that are not at all palatable to us, or else we figure out how to, you know, harness the power of the microorganisms to turn the food into something that is, you know, more delicious, more stable, more digestible, or, you know, in some ways, um, um, you know, better. Um, than, than, than it was. Um, you know, coexisting with microorganisms is a biological imperative. Um, the fermentation arts are the human cultural manifestations of this biological um, imperative. Um, so, um, you know, so as, as, as we evolved, we evolved with bacteria, as human cultural practices evolved, we, they evolved in the context of the reality that bacteria and fungi were part of all of our food. And we, you know, even though it's only in the last, you know, 150 years that we have been, you know, sort of specifically conceptualizing it as, you know, microorganisms, they still were no less of a reality that people had to deal with. And this is why, um, you know, cultures all around the world, I mean, I do not know about every single cultural tradition, culinary tradition that exists around the world, um, but I've, I've, I've looked really hard for a counterexample of any kind of, you know, culinary tradition that does not incorporate any kind of fermentation, and I can't find any, and, uh, you know, and I, I, I have come to firmly believe that, that, that they just could not exist because of this, you know, sort of inevitability of the presence of, of, of uh, fermenting organisms, uh, or, you know, all sorts of organisms on, on our food. Um, okay, now let me talk a little bit about, uh, about culture. Um, you know, culture is a big word. Um, you know, culture describes, um, you know, science and language and literature and music and religious practices and beliefs and thank you. Um, you know, and the totality of all the people seek to pass down from generation to generation. You know, when we look at the word um, uh, culture, it comes from Latin for cultivation. And, um, you know, the, the idea is that the, you know, sort of, um, um, you know, origins of culture or whatever are, um, you know, you, uh, um, are, is related to the, 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 the cultivation of, of the soil and the development of, you know, ideas about, about, you know, how to do that. We're developing techniques that we, you know, that we, that, that, that we are passing down and, and all that, all that comes, comes with that. Um, I think it's fat. Then we also use the same word to describe little communities of bacteria. 
So, you know, when we make yogurt and transfer a scoop of mature yogurt containing not only yogurt, but, uh, you know, but these bacteria that, that have turned the milk into yogurt, and we introduce that into new milk, we call that a culture, and we call the, the act of introducing it into the milk is culturing. So, I think it's fascinating that we use the same word to describe these little, you know, communities of bacteria that, 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 that we, um, you know, have harnessed to tr transform our food that we use to describe this, you know, sort of totality of everything that we seek to pass down from generation to generation. And as it turns out, you know, in, in, in so many um, human cultures, these cultured foods are really uh, are really central to culinary traditions and even to um, and even to cultural identity. Um, so you know many cultures around the world have very distinctive foods that um, that, that 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 people within the culture are acculturated to um, you know be able to enjoy. And yet uh, people from outside of the culture who, who might come and visit or might be exposed to the culture are often very put off by some of these foods. So one culture's, you know, sort of highest expression of their, um, uh, you know, culinary arts is often, you know, the worst nightmare of somebody who's outside of the culture. Um, and actually, I mean, I was, I was recently reading about a, um, a Hawaiian and South Pacific ferment called poi, which is um, fermented taro. And I was reading um, an anthropologist's uh, um, uh, account from the 1930s. And, you know, the anthropologist who was writing this paper found the poi so horribly distasteful that he speculated that there must be like a gene, a poi gene, that, you know, sort of enabled the South Pacific uh, Islanders to enjoy this food that was just so intrinsically repulsive to, um, um, you know, to this, to this European guy. But re really, it's not, you know, there's not a poi gene, there's not a Limburger cheese gene, there's not a natto gene, um, there's not a fish sauce gene, you know, it's just what you're used to. And I think we probably all can relate to the idea um, in, the, in the realm of cheese. I, th I think we probably all can, you know, probably you know, half of us or a third of us in this room um, love stinky cheeses um, and you know once in a while we'll go and um, you know go to a gourmet food store um, that you know sells a bunch of different cheeses and you know splurge on a chunk of really stinky cheese and we'll um, you know we'll we'll invite some friends over to share that with us but guess what not all of our friends like that you know some people don't even want to be in the same room because they they find the smell of it just so utterly offensive and they could never even consider putting it in their mouths um, and you know the world is full of these foods that you know to 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 to, to you know a certain um, uh, you know, portion of the population, you know, or, or people who were raised around the food is just like as good as it gets. And for, you know, people who are not familiar with it, it's just, you know, scary, it smells like death or rotting or, you know, something that, 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 that's scary to them. Um, Something else that I want to talk, talk that, that I want to um, address, um, which, which Shoshi specifically um, expressed interest in is, um, the role of um, you know fermentation in um, ritual and religious iconography, and um, you know be, because the like the defining characteristic of, of fermentation is bubbles. You know you when when you when you set up a fermentation, you sort of watch it come to life. I mean literally, it is coming to life. But that's been you know that that's been really understood in many indigenous cultures around the world as a very you know kind of magical um, a, event. You know the the introduction of life forces to the um, you know to 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 whatever the you know liquid substrate usually that's being turned into an alcoholic beverage is. So there's you know lots of examples of you know cultures that 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 had uh, elaborate ritual around it. You know in some cases um, it was. It, it, it was understood that you know people had to teach the ferment 
how to dance. So you know, people would make a lot of noise and dance around it, um, um, and and basically, you know teach it how to be active and, and, and do that until it got active. And then in some other places, they approached it in exactly the opposite way, where they felt like, you know, it needed to be undisturbed. It needed quiet and reverence. And so, so people would, would, would leave it alone and had a, had a very different um, um, understanding of it. If you look at the pantheons of different, um, you know, uh, um, um, pantheistic religions um, um, to which there is you know surviving documentation I mean in Egypt there was a, a goddess of beer Ninkasi um, and in Lithuania there was a god of pickles uh, Rogusi um, so you know lot like lot, lots of pantheistic um, um, belief systems you know have some sort of specific god or goddesses or more than one of them um, uh, oh, in, 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 in Greek mythology there was there was Bacchus who was the god of uh, who was the god of wine, but you know even in our um, you know modern day you know monotheistic religions, well you know I mean, in, in Islam there's a there's a prohibition on alcohol, um, you know in, 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 in Judaism we, we say a, we, we we say a prayer, bore um, pori hagafin you know blessed is the creator of the fruit of the vine and we repeat it with you know multiple um, <laughs> with, with with multiple drinks of wine and in in the Roman Catholic Mass you know what is it that is you know transubstantiated from the blood of Jesus Christ it's wine um, so 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 you know even in our you know contemporary monotheistic world religions um, you know fermented uh, products of fermentation continue to have um, you know a really central uh, place in our religious iconography I want to mention one other aspect of culture which is technology um, the um, uh, the McDonald's brought this beautiful kraut shredding device which uh, which you can see in the in, in, in the back of the in, in, in the back of the room, and that's uh, the, you know that, that that one that they have there is probably a 19th century um, um, shredding device. Um, but you know the desire for fermented foods and beverages has given rise to incredible amounts of um, of innovation. And um, you know if you try to um, imagine the roots of pottery. I mean, you know, what greater incentive could there have been for people to, you know, develop the technology of, 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 of ceramic vessels than to have vessels to ferment um, a liquid in? So, you know, humans didn't invent fermentation. I mean, you know, there's lots of documentation of all sorts of animals being attracted to fermenting fruit and, um, and even documentation of animals becoming inebriated from um, gorging on fermented fruit. Um, and we can certainly, um, you know, surmise that our primate ancestors, um, you know, in the, uh, in the African jungle were, you know, occasionally enjoying the, 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 the pleasures of, um, you know, gorging themselves with fermented fruit. But what's really the uniquely human achievement is, you know, figuring out how to make it happen. So you don't have to wait for it to spontaneously occur, um, you know, during those, you know, sort of um, 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 over-ripening moments when, when they do spontaneously occur. So, you know, so it's, so it's humans largely because we created vessels that could contain these things. Um, you know, actually, I mean, Claude Levi-Strauss, you know, who does lots of speculating about the origins of culture, you know, has, has some interesting speculation about the origins of alcoholic beverages. And he, he basically calls, you know, a, a hollowed out tree that will hold water um, is like the transitional object from nature to culture. And I'm not sure I sort of like, I follow along with his argument the whole way, but this, you know, idea that it's a significant moment when, 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 when people realize that rather than just sort of, you know, waiting to find, you know, a beehive of, uh, filled with honey to wash out from a tree during a storm and sort of get diluted in a puddle and have someone taste it and say like, oh, that's really good. Oh, that's making me feel good. Um, you know, when people begin began to intentionally do that, climb up in a tree and harvest the, the hive with honey. You know, find some, some sort of a vessel to, to, to place it in and, um, and dilute it with water, bring some intentionality to the process. So, you know, a lot of our, um, you know, a lot of our cultural development, a lot of our, 
um, you know, uh, technology that we've developed, you know, really has been in response to this, you know, this this burning desire for, um, you know, fermented beverages and and other types of products of fermentation. Um, now, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, my third theme: community. Um, Microorganisms, as I mentioned earlier, like never exist in sort of you know singular, isolated species. You never find just yeast, Saccharomyces, like all on its own. You never find uh, you know Lactobacillus just on its own. You know microorganisms, like all other forms of life, you know exist in communities uh, with, with 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 interactions. I think this is it's a really um, you know important concept. I mean the. The, the thrust of you know, the literature of fermentation and the science of fermentation throughout the 20th century, um, you know, including the esteemed Dr. Steinkraus, has all been all about you know, isolating individual organisms. And in many cases, it's been about you know, how can we um, you know, improve upon um, an indigenous practice that people have been doing and enjoying within their communities? How can we sort of look at what they've been doing and pull out the important organisms and then do that in a more hygienic way in a factory with more efficient um, production and you know all around the world you know part of um, you know part of the process of you know cultures being destroyed and of cultural homogenization has been sort of you know killing off the um, you know uh, indigenous community based fermentation processes and moving these things into factory production which you know has the result of you know disempowering people and uh, and breeding dependence on um, you know a, a, on a product that they have to buy that they previously had been able to um, uh, create for them themselves. Um, now, I mean, food is really something, food and beverages brings people together. I mean, you know, when, 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 when communities of people, when, 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 when families, when, um, uh, you know, any groups of people come together, it is most often around food. You know, food is one of the greatest community builders that there are. Um, and, you know, really the, the, the process of, um, you know, growing food, transforming the raw products of agriculture into the foods that people actually like to eat, um, you know, these are all community activities. You know, there, we have this little myth of, like, total self-sufficiency, um, you know, where, um, you know, sort of like our one family, you know, goes off into the woods and sort of, you know, creates a homestead, grows all of their own food, you know, mills their own grain, bakes their own bread, and um, and that it's exactly a myth. I mean, it's impossible. I mean, you know, how can how can anyone do all of that on their own? We could have local food self-sufficiency. We could have regional self -su food self-sufficiency, but um, you know. It's got to be a community activity, you know. I mean, if it takes a village to raise a child, I mean, you know, what does it take to, you know, to to, to have a well-rounded diet? I mean, it takes lots of people doing lots of different things, and, you know, the the fermentation arts are all extraordinarily simple at their basis. I mean, they're all ancient rituals that people have been doing forever, um, or for you know, a, or or for longer time than than we know, because you know the the origins of the ferments are not documented at all, because they they they, they predate recorded history. They're they're prehistoric. The you know earliest written documents in different languages refer to the ferments that already existed in in, in those traditions. Um, but it's given rise to a huge amount of specialization. So, you know, I mean, any of us could, you know, learn how to brew beer. We could learn how to, you know, make some basic cheeses. We could learn how to make sauerkraut. Um, um, you know, any of these, uh, you know, very uh, uh, popular ferments. But it's not realistic that any one of us could do all of those things or learn how to do them all with any level of proficiency or do them regularly. Um, so, 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 so really, I mean, even when we're talking about, um, um, you know, b b reviving local production, I mean, we're, we're talking about sort of, you know, rebuilding webs in our communities, webs of, we webs of food production and webs of, of, of exchange. And, um, 
you know, in terms of the, the broader agenda that I'm interested in, which is, you know, reclaiming our food, um, um, you know, bringing production, you know, back to earth, um, um, you know, uh, um, recreating alternatives to mass-produced foods, um, you know, really for the, for the, you know, since the Second World War, the, you know, the, 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 the development, you know, first in the U.S. and, and, and then the rest of the world, um, uh, or most of the rest of the world fo following suit, has been centralizing production, mass production of food. Uh, as far as I can tell, the mass production of food has been a failure. Um, and we need to, um, you know, we, we need to revive the ideas of regional and local uh, uh, production of food. It's been, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it's been a failure because, you know, it's producing uh, 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 nutritionally diminished food that's making us sick. Um, you know, right now, for the first time uh, in American history, dem demographers are thinking that our children's life sp lifespans are likely to be shorter than ours, and one of the reasons for this is the, you know, diminished nutritional quality um, of the food that we're eating. Um, the means by which we are mass producing food is, you know, polluting the earth, depleting water resources, uh, polluting the water, creating new forms of pollution like genetic pollution that we don't really know how to deal with. Um, the way that we're, 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 we're um, uh, uh, you know the mass, the centralized production of food and the transportation of it. It uses a huge amount of energy, um, and you know as long as that energy is available and cheap. I mean, I guess there's there's thousands of products in every supermarket that we can buy, but you know that's a big if. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, following the logic of you know peak oil and the idea that you know oil is becoming, um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, rarer and more expensive, uh, both in monetary terms and in environmental terms, to extract from the earth. Um, you know, is what are the implications of that on on food prices and on food availability? And beyond, you know, beyond the transport, beyond the the, the fuel involved in transporting food vast distances. Um, you know, there's 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 the question of. Um, vulnerability to disruptions, all sorts of disruptions, whether it's from natural disasters or extreme weather events or, uh, you know, wars or terrorism or other kinds of political violence. Um, and, and, and basically being dependent on food resources far away, you know, just, just makes us exceedingly um, vulnerable. So, um, so, so really, like, I think that, you know, for me, the big picture of why fermentation is important and why reskilling people with, um, um, you know, the ability to ferment food for themselves isn't so everybody can make everything for themselves, but it's so that it's because that's such an integral part of, of um, you know, redeveloping, um, you know, community, local, regional food self-sufficiency. I mean, people don't just eat the raw products of agriculture. You know, people People love to eat all the things that you turn the raw products of agriculture into, um, and these are largely fermented products. Um, so anyway, I could really go on and on, but it'll be much more um, interesting and fun if we make this a little bit interactive. So um, is the, does anyone have any um, uh, um, questions or comments or, um, or uh, bones to pick or things they want to argue about or anything? Okay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So it can't grow in an acidic environment. I mean, one of the reasons why acidification is such a brilliant strategy for food um, uh, preservation is because it's also a strategy for food safety. And, you know, not only botulism, but, you know, E. coli, uh, especially E. coli 0157, and salmonella, and listeria, and, you know, really any of the food poisoning organisms that any of us have heard the names of, you know, can't grow in an acidic environment. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's another reason why why why, um, why why fermentation is so safe. I mean, fermented vegetables, as far as I can tell, are the safest food that exists on this earth. They're certainly safer than raw vegetables. They're according to according to the USDA, there has never been a single case of food poisoning reported in the United States from food poisoning. Um, <laughs> from fermented vegetables. Um, so how many, how many foods could you say that about? I mean, you certainly couldn't say that about raw vegetables or fruits or, or, or meats. Um, 
or not. I mean, you know, every, every year, you know, we, we read all these accounts of, you know, spinach, lettuce, <laughs> tomatoes, almonds, apples. I mean, it's one thing after another. So, you know, obviously, incidence of contamination is, is a reality. You know, you have a, you have a, you know, a farm that's growing uh, uh, lettuce in fields, and, and then there's a, you know, farm a little bit uphill where there's, you know, animals in confinement, and some of their manure, um, uh, you know, trickles down the hill, gets on the lettuce leaves, and, you know, there's always the potential for raw foods to, to get contaminated. Um, if you took the contaminated vegetables and chopped them up and salted them and stuffed them into a crop to make sauerkraut out of them, the proliferation of lactic acid bacteria um, um, uh, you know, would, 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 would overwhelm the incidental contaminants, and then as the environment acidified, the contaminating bacteria would be destroyed. Um, so, so, so that's why there's never been, um, you know, a case of food poisoning reported from fermented vegetables. I mean, it's not that it's impossible for, you know, cabbages or other vegetables that you might incorporate into your sauerkraut to become contaminated. It's that even if they are contaminated, um, you know, sauerkraut has this like sort of built-in um, um, defense strategy. I mean, acidification is a you know just hugely important means of protection. In fact, human reproduction would not be possible without um, um, lactic acid fermentation. I mean, basically, in women's vaginas, there are populations of lactobacilli, and actually, uh, women's bodies produce a specific carbohydrate, glycogen, to, um, to support those populations, and it's the acidification by those lactobacilli that facilitate effective human reproduction. And then the, the flip side of that is that when, you know, when babies are born, you know, when their fetus is in the womb, they're in a sterile environment, but it's sort of, you know, in their transit, um, um, you know, out of the womb, um, that they first get populated by bacteria. And so, you know, the first bacteria that, 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 that babies get, uh, get exposed to are lactic acid bacteria. And then, of course, they continue to get exposed to lactic acid bacteria uh, as they're breastfeeding, and it's that sort of, you know, um, buildup of, of lactic acid bacteria and other bacteria in their guts that enable them to begin to digest solid food. So, you know, human beings have a very, very intimate relationship with lactic acid bacteria um, in particular. And that's why, you know, live culture lactic acid fermented foods, um, you know, can be so beneficial to our health because there are all these factors in our contemporary lives chemicals in our contemporary lives, antibiotic drugs, antibacterial cleansing products, um, chlorinated water, that have the accumulated result of um, um, assaulting the bacteria in our guts on a daily basis. And so, you know, it's just become important to, um, you know, replenish, diversify um, um, those populations, and um, uh, fermented foods are a, a really great way of doing that. Um, are there any other uh, comments, questions? Okay, question about Ayurvedic practitioners saying that too much um, uh, fermented foods um, uh, create too much acidity and inflammation. Um, so, okay, one thing about eating acidic um, um, live cultured foods, is even though they are acidic, because they make minerals so much more bioavailable, they actually have the net effect of alkalinizing us, even though they are acidic. Now, I mean, I'm not, I'm not advocating that everybody just eat fermented foods. I mean, too much of a good thing that can be a bad thing. I mean, it's really important to eat fresh vegetables too. There's been a little bit of a correlation in, 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 in some places in Asia between high consumption of salty, preserved vegetables and um, um, esophageal cancers. Um, but, but, but basically, when they look at, like the elevated levels of cancers are among people who like eat almost exclusively fermented vegetables as their source of vegetables. And once you look at people who eat a balance between fermented vegetables and 
non-fermented fresh vegetables, then you see that, 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 that then, then there's no elevation of esophageal cancer. I don't think it's really of any benefit to eat only fermented foods. Um, but, 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 but they, but, but, well, first of all, I mean, in many places, especially historically, in the winter time, that has been the fresh vegetables that people have had available to them. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, in, in, in our time where, you know, even in the context of, uh, you know, revival of local agriculture in a, you know, temperate place like this that has a limited growing season, you know, there, we have hoop houses now, you know, there's ways that people can have, um, can, can have, um, uh, you know, some fresh vegetables, you know, and fermented vegetables really all, all year around. Now, in terms of Ayurveda, it's interesting because, you know, I have heard this idea that, that, that Ayurvedic medicine um, sort of has a bias against fermented um, uh, foods. But, you know, what I've learned is that there's a whole branch of Ayurvedic medicine where they make uh, medicinal preparations out of different kinds of um, plants where the plants are fermented, like that's that that's integral to making the medicine because they understand that the the fermentation transforms the you know medicinal um, um, actions of, of of different plants and phytochemicals just through the fact that they're fermented. So I mean, Ayurveda is not um, you know unilaterally opposed to fermented vegetable to, 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 to fermentation. Um, but you know, I think I mean moderation is a really good thing for um, you know for, for, for any of us to, to keep in mind. You know, I mean, alcoholic beverages are beloved, but it's really important to uh, you know enjoy them you know with a sense of moderation. You know, same with fermented vegetables, fermented soybeans and, and really any That's so I have pretty good luck with um, kimchi and sauerkraut and those kinds of things. But I find that it's a pithier proposition in terms of serving things like cucumbers or green tomatoes. So I'm just wondering if you have some tricks that... Yeah, sure. I'm here. So, so cucumbers are pretty much the most challenging vegetable to ferment. Um, and one reason is that they're so watery. Another reason is that the time when they're ripe is the time when temperatures are highest. Um, you know, the best vegetables for, uh, for preservation are vegetables that ripen when it's cool. Um, and and, and, and um, cucumbers ripen when it's hot. Um, the best method that, I, that I've used for keeping, and, and really the, the, the issue is that they get mushy. Okay, so it's not that they like get toxic or, or taste horrible, it's that they, they, they lose their nice crunchiness and get really mushy. And so, okay, I, I mean a basic, um, uh, you know, a basic sort of, you know, conceptual idea is that, you know, all living things contain the enzymes to digest themselves. Um, and so, you know, vegetables all contain enzymes that, you know, digest the vegetables in different ways. So, um, so there are these pectinase enzymes that exist in vegetables that digest the, 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 that digest the pectins. And so when cucumbers get really mushy, it's really because of the pectinase enzymes. Um, and, um, I mean, one solution is to find a cool fermentation spot. So like, you know, an unheated cellar is, is kind of ideal. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, grape leaves. So there's all these tannin-rich leaves seem to inhibit these enzymes. So, um, so grape leaves, oak leaves, sour cherry leaves. Um, I've also used tea bags when I couldn't find any of those things. Um, um, but but you know those, those are techniques for, um, for for keeping the cucumbers crunchier for longer. When I make when I make cucumber uh, pickles in the summertime, I mean I typically in, in Tennessee heat where it's you know t generally you know 95 degrees every afternoon when the sun, when, when the cucumbers are ripe, I ferment them for just two or three days and then I move them to a refrigerator. Um, you know so it's so so it's not you know whereas when I make. Um, you know, sauerkraut from cabbage or from radishes in the, um, uh, you know, in November, you know, I'm still eating that and I'll be eating that up until, you know, June or July. 
and it, you know, and it's got a perfectly wonderful um, texture. So, um, you know, it's really like a short fermentation time with these tannin-rich leaves, and then getting them into a, a, a cool spot. A really short fermentation time compared to a, anything else. And what's the ideal temperature range for long-term storage? If you ever I would say, you know, earth temperature, 55 degrees, 55 to 60 degrees. Oh, so there are a lot of sort of industrially produced fermented foods. You, know, you go to the Green Star and you see the kombucha that's sold all across the country. I don't personally think it's as good as the homemade stuff. I'm curious if there's a trade-off between ramping up production and maintaining the cultural integrity of the products? Well, that is a great question. Um, okay, so, so, so some of you probably remember that uh, maybe a year and a half ago, there was a, uh, uh, there, there was a big um, sort of scare about kombucha and it was removed from the shelves of a lot of stores. Uh, most notably Whole Foods, and that was because, um, um, you know, I guess it was the, the FDA um, sampled some uh, some bottles and found alcohol levels that were above 0.5 percent, which is the you know cutoff for foods or beverages to be um, marketed um, not as alcoholic beverages, um, and. So actually, many people who are producing kombucha stopped using the you know sort of traditional um, um, culture for making kombucha, which is a k k kombucha, um, kefir, and a couple of other ferments are really notable for their cultures because their cultures have evolved into really distinctive physical forms. So if any of you have ever seen a mother of kombucha, it's this like rubbery disc. Um, that you know floats at the top of the sweet tea that it's fermenting. It begins as just a thin film, but it gets thicker and thicker. And I mean, I've seen them this thick, you know, floating on top of the uh, of, 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 of the sweet tea. So and, and that's it. and it's a community of organisms. Um, it's called a SCOBY in the literature. S C O B Y, symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast. Um, and so, so, you know, this is what defines kombucha. Um, another scoby is kefir. It's a little, looks like a little florets of cauliflower. Um, and, and, and they're called kefir grains or sometimes kefir curds. And similarly, it's a community of organisms. The, 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 the kefir community has been uh, uh, much studied. Uh, Lynn Margulis identified more than 30 distinct microorganisms that are present in the kefir um, um, community. But you know, sometimes these scobies are challenging for commercial production because it's very difficult to standardize. So you will not find a commercial kefir for sale in the United States that you know, I think is worthy of being called kefir because they're not made with scoby, which is you know, what has historically defined this food. Instead, you know, some microbiologists like looked under the microscope and you know, sort of like I pulled off a few of the organisms that are present in kefir. And so now kefir that's commercially available is a cultured milk product made with a few of the individual organisms that were extracted from kefir grains, but not with the full community because one of the organisms in the community in kefir is Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast that transforms lactose into alcohol. When you're trying to sell a fermented milk product in a natural food store and market it for children, it becomes problematic if it has more than 0.5% alcohol. And you know, typically kefir will have 0.8% you know, alcohol or maybe 1.1% alcohol. I mean, you would need to drink an awful lot of it to you know, feel the alcohol, but nonetheless, it is, it is present. So it creates you know, huge regulatory challenges. Plus, your starter is something that keeps growing. So you know, if you're trying to standardize production, have exactly the same length of time for each batch, if your starter keeps growing, it's really, really hard to standardize it. 
So, um, so, so, so basically the way people, at least in the United States context, have gotten around this is they've just extracted a few organisms from that. They call that you know, kefir starter. You can buy different powdered kefir starters that I think it should be illegal to call kefir. I mean, they, they might be perfectly wonderful cultured milk products, but you know, kefir is this you know, community of organisms from the Caucasus Mountains that is you know, sort of embodied in a physical form that is evolved. I mean, there have also been you know, a multitude of experiments in laboratories where people take as many of these individual organisms as they can and then like, put them together in a test tube and try to you know, create a new life out of them and get and, 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 you know, and, and create a, a, another, a new kefir brand. And, and nobody's been able to do it. I mean, you know, it's like kefir begets kefir the way elephants beget elephants. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's like it's, 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 it's been able to create it in a, in, in, in a laboratory. But anyway, going back to kombucha, um, a lot of the kombucha manufacturers now, you know, be, because there's this sort of problem with alcohol in, you know, in the kombucha sometimes, I mean, really, as long as kombucha is exposed to air, alcohol doesn't accumulate. There's, there's always going to be traces of alcohol, but because it's exposed to air, alcohol exposed to air turns into acetic acid. There are bacteria called acetobacter that consume alcohol and transform it into acetic acid. But as soon as you seal it into a bottle, then um, you know, there, there are yeast as part of that community that do produce alcohol. So when you seal it into a bottle and there's, there's no longer a flow of, of oxygen, then you start to have greater potential for, uh, for alcohol accumulation. And that's what happened with uh, you know, the ones that uh, you know, caused this big scare. But as a result, many of the manufacturers have ceased using the traditional kombucha culture and instead are using you know, various extracts of you know, a few of the organisms uh, you know, from the traditional uh, uh, kombucha culture and, and, and uh, uh, leaving out the yeast and other ones that, that might be perceived as being problematic. So there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of fermented foods that are being marketed that are really like, I, I mean, they have live cultures. It's not that they're bad things. It's just that, you know, they are not the things that they are purporting to be. They're not the things that sort of, you know, have historically defined those, um, those particular foods. So, I mean, so I think that there's that. And then there's, there's also just, you know, this is, fermented foods are like the ultimate in like, in localism and the specificity of place. And I think that, you know, cheeses are an especially good illustration of this because, you know, like all of these, you know, kind of crazy different kinds of cheeses that, that, that exist. And, you know, really what we can find in, you know, fancy cheese stores in the United States is, you know, like just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you know, when I'm, um, a couple of years ago, I went to um, this international slow, uh, slow food gathering in Italy called Terra Madre, and um, you know, they, 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 one of the things that slow foods is doing is you know, sort of trying to promote and protect foods that are that are perceived as as being um, at some risk of extinction, and so. Um, um, you know, there were all these really obscure cheeses like I'd never seen before. I mean, there were cheeses where the sort of, you know, wrapping was the bark of a tree. There were, there were cheeses where the wrapping was the, the, the skin of an animal. I mean, it was really just like extraordinary, you know, range of styles of cheese making. But really, you know, ultimately, you know, they're, they're defined by, you know, the, the, the pastures on which different animals are grazing and the seasons in which they're being milked and more than anything, by the environments in which they are being aged. And so, you know, historically, specific cheeses were just produced in specific places. And, you know, now in Europe, they have this sort of, you know, um, uh, you know legal mechanism for, you know, protecting certain foods that, you know, you can only use the name of the food in that particular place. But as a practical matter, there are all of these, you know, sort of, uh, 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 you know, catalogs and um, you know suppliers where you can buy all these different cheese cultures and so you know you can buy you know um, you know like the culture for a camembert I mean you know that evolved as a response to a specific set of environmental conditions but now you know you can you can buy that culture and make 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 cheese with it and so you know, most cheesemakers are really trying to replicate certain classic styles of cheese, which is, which is wonderful. I mean, the classic styles of cheese 
are great. But you know, because each cheese sort of evolved as a specific response to specific environment, there are lots of cheeses that are not being made because you know a, a smaller and smaller group of them are the sort of you know, popular cheeses that are being um, uh, you know widely copied and, and manufactured and, and, and marketed. But there are many more cheeses that are not being copied and marketed. And so there, there, there's actually this very interesting um, um, uh, uh, woman, um, uh, Marcelino is her, is her last name. She's a cheesemaker who got interested in microbiology and got a PhD in microbiology. And um, you know, she's been basically writing about the loss of biodiversity in cheeses. So you know, as people are you know, uh, focused more and more on a, on, a, on a limited number of cheeses and you know, sort of buying those um, specific cultures, there are all these other cheeses that are just falling by the wayside. And, and all these cultures, I mean, you know, basically, um, Fresh milk, as, 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 as you know, most of us grew up um, um, drinking it, I mean, that's a, it's a 20th century phenomenon. It's only possible to have you know, widespread enjoyment of fresh milk if you have widespread refrigeration. And so you know, really the origin of all cheeses is just the, the inevitable process of milk souring. And so, you know, most people throughout history and most people still in the world, with the milk that they've had access to is sour milk. Um, and there's been all this diversity of sour milks. And so we have a word in English that's become really um, uh, kind of obsolete, clabbering, clabbered milk. And that really means, you know, like raw milk left out will acidify and, uh, and thicken itself just, just through bacterial processes. Um, but, you know, clabbered milk in, you know, different environments and different seasons will have very different kinds of flavors. And so when people had a clabbered milk that they especially liked, they would take a little bit of that sour milk and introduce that into the next batch of milk. And in the technical literature, that's called back slopping. We would uh, take a little bit of the last batch and introduce that into the next batch, and that can be a, a, a continuous process. So all around the world, like everywhere where people domesticated uh, ruminant animals for their milk, um, uh, people drank sour milk, and all these distinctive styles of sour milk um, um, developed. Uh, you know, now, um, you know, now that yogurt has become this globalized process, I mean, basically the only vocabulary we have for talking about these is to refer to them as yogurts. So, you know, to use another slow food example, there's a, there's a, a, a fermented um, uh, uh, milk in a region of Kenya um, that's very distinctive. It's, uh, it's always fermented in a gourd. They add the ash of a particular plant to it. Um, you know, as part of the process and part of like creating a selective environment. Um, and slow food is championing this, but they can only call it, like the only word they have is to call it is, is Kenyan yogurt. It has nothing to do with yogurt whatsoever. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a different fermented milk, but you know, like all processes of cultural homogenization, like language is dying um, and, 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 you know, uh, you know, Everybody speaking a smaller number of languages, like the same thing is happening with these with these milks, where you know all of these distinctive styles of of, of, of cultured, soured, fermented milks um, are sort of falling by the wayside as more and more people are are you know, kind of embracing the you know kind of dominant global commodities like yogurt. And I mean I mean yogurt, no disrespect by by, by saying this. And you know just another you know another note on yogurt that people who have been coming to a couple of talks have already heard me talk about, but I will go ahead and repeat it. Um, you know, how many people here have ever tried to make yogurt? Okay, I mean, it's something that like a lot of people experiment with. I and mean, if you go buy a package of yogurt at the store, you, know, you can buy plain, you know, Stonyfield, Dannon, whatever kind of yogurt, and you take a little scoop of that, and you heat up your milk, you cool it down to 110, you introduce that milk, you create some sort of an incubation uh, chamber to try to maintain it around 110 degrees for, for several hours. Um, and you can make beautiful yogurt, and then out of that yogurt, you could make another batch of yogurt. But as you get into like the third batch and the fourth batch, like suddenly the yogurt's not staying so thick anymore. Um, and it's just like with the kefir and the kombucha. You know, yogurt, yogurt has, you know, has been a, um, a community of organisms. 
and microbiologists at the Pasteur Institute at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, looked at yogurt under the microscope and decided like, you know, uh, this one, Lactobacillus bulgaricus, or and this one, uh, Streptococcus thermophilus. Like these are, you know, the important bacteria for yogurt that make yogurt thicken. When there were lots of other bacteria there. So, so all of the commercial yogurts, starting with you know, the Danone company in Barcelona in 1919, have been like, making yogurt out of you know, selected um, you know, individual strains of bacteria. I mean, they combine a couple or two or three or four different bacteria, but that's not the same as an evolved community that has um, inherent stability and defense strategies to protect it from other kinds of bacteria and other you know, uh, uh, forms of life that can attack bacteria. So these evolved communities have elaborate defense strategies. So traditional yogurts, you know, people got the culture from their, you know, grandmother who got it from her grandmother and it just like passed down from generation to generation. When people try to make yogurt with con contemporary um, supermarket yogurt, you can make wonderful yogurt for a generation or two. And then everybody has to go back to the store and buy another cup of yogurt to do another generation or two. Um, so, um, you know, so these traditional mixed cultures really are, you know, they're, 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 they're easier to propagate because they have this, um, you know, th th there, there is this like community dynamics and community stability. And once we isolate individual organisms and, um, you know, I'm, I mean, it can have practical benefit. You know, I'm sure for yogurt manufacturers, it's much more sort of consistent and predictable to work with, you know, a couple of isolated uh, uh, bacteria than to work with a, with a community. But for, um, you know, people who are, who are household or community level, practitioners it is you know it, it is ultimately a disempowering process because you know a generalist cannot you know isolate um, uh, individual bacteria and propagate individual bacteria effectively so now you know instead of you know being able to you know to just continue propagating the, 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 the you know culture received from you know your, your great-grandmother you know you have to keep on going and buying another starter and um, you know, really, like the, the whole thrust of you know fermentation science and fermentation literature throughout the 20th century has been all about this, like isolating individual organisms in the name of you know improved production. And to me, it's exactly analogous to the process of um, you know hybrid seeds replacing um, you know sort of. Uh, um, you know, seeds that, 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 that farmers had saved over the course of generations that were well adapted to local conditions. You know, the seed breed breeders, you know, created seeds that did have improvements and under ideal circumstances, you know, they would give, you know, higher yields or, you know, bigger vegetables or, you know, other types of improvements. But, um, but you know, not everyone's farm is ideal conditions. So what it meant is, you know, people had to put in irrigation systems. Um, and so, you know, that's expensive and ultimately has ended up depleting water resources. Um, you know, they're not as well adapted to, you know, local pests or, or fungi. So then people need to, you know, buy chemicals to put on those. And then you have to buy the seeds themselves because it's not within the, you know, realm of what a generalist farmer can do to sort of, you know, create their own hybrid seeds. So, you know, we replaced a process that was self-perpetuating with a process where, you know, the practitioners are, 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 are disempowered and, 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 and forced to sort of, you know, purchase a product from some experts who know, who know how to do it. So, um, so, you know, that's been the thrust of the fermentation science and literature, you know, through the 20th century. And, um, you know, what my interest is and what, you know, the, the books that I've been writing are all about the opposite. We're trying to help empower people with skills to, 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 to you know, take back these processes and start doing them um, in their homes. And there are still heirloom yogurt cultures available. And um, you know the internet actually has turned out to be an amazing tool for spreading things like that around. So you know after years of occasionally making yogurt and then feeling discouraged when it stopped working after a couple of generations, a couple of years ago I got hold of I got a hold of um, uh, an heirloom yogurt culture uh, uh, you know on the internet culturesforhealth.com 
And um, you know, I, I estimate that I've done 45 generations so far with the same yogurt culture, and you know, just each batch is just as you know, thick and delicious as the previous batch was. Um, in February, I had the I had the opportunity to go to Indonesia, and um, and I got to visit a, a, a village where they make tempeh. Now, I've been making tempeh for 15 years, and I always use a, a pure culture starter, Rhizopus oligosporus uh, varicito, which Dr. Steinkraus actually um, um, gave to the USDA. So there's a USDA culture collection, and it has this sort of you know one. Um, uh, um, uh, strain of Rhizopus oligosporus, and all of the tempeh that's been manufactured commercially in the United States has been made with this single strain. And um, you know, I've, I've you know sort of learned how to propagate the single strain, and it really you know kind of strains my abilities as a you know generalist without a laboratory to be able to propagate the single strain. I you know have to use a pressure cooker, and um, you know it's you know I have to you know kind of wipe down everything and just make sure things are you know as. Uh, well, I mean, obviously it's not sterile in my kitchen, but um, you know things are are, are 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 as sanitized as possible. And then you know I've had mixed results. Like sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. Usually I end up just buying my tempeh starter from a, a mail order source. But when I went to Indonesia, you know what I found in this village where they make tempeh is like a leaf. They sandwich some some inoculated soybeans between two leaves. They over ripened it dried it in the sun, when they opened it up, you see two colors of sporulation. You see black, which is the color of the sporulation of Rhizopus oligosporus, and I saw yellow, which is the color of sporulation of, of, of uh, Aspergillus um, uh, food, food um, um, uh, um, fungi. And then, you know, also, be, just because it was in an open environment, there's all sorts of bacteria. And so, you know, you use that to inoculate the soybeans. Um, you make beautiful tempeh that actually has like a more, uh, you know, a more complex um, uh, uh, flavor to it. And then when you need more starter, you just take some of those inoculated soybeans, put them between two leaves, and it's easy for a generalist to propagate. And just, you know, conceptually, you know, any, for any ferment to be a sort of, you know, a continuous um, um, uh, um, Process, you know, from whatever its origins are to, to, to the present, you know, people didn't have microscopes, people didn't have sterile laboratories, people had to be able to propagate these things themselves. And, you know, whatever the improvements might be for commercial production to have isolated, pure cultures, they're not, uh, you know, they're not better for the uh, home practitioner. Mixed cultures are much, much easier to work with because there's this like community stability that's kind of inherent in you know groups of organisms that have uh, evolved together. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm curious about your new book that's coming out and sort of what ideas you're able to develop and some process as well. Well, I mean, you know, kind of some of what I've just been, been talking about. I mean, this sort of, you know, pure culture versus mixed culture um, idea. Um, my opening chapter is called Fermentation as a Co-Evolutionary Force, and some of the stuff that I, that, that I started by, that I started out talking about, you know, I, I, I developed um, um, in, 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 I develop more. Um, but, but really, more than anything, I mean, it's another book that's, you know, how to ferment things yourself. And it's a book that, you know, I couldn't have written in 2001 when I wrote Wild Fermentation. It's, you know, I mean, any book is like a little slice in time. And, you know, I mean, any, you know, anyone who writes a book, you know, hopefully is someone who's like, you know, continuing to take in information and learn things. And so, you know, in 2001, I had um, eight years of experience fermenting. And it was mostly just me and a few books that I found, and you know all of my friends that I would you know subject to my experiments. <laughs> um, and then you know since the book came out, you know I've I've, I've just gotten to teach all over, and um, you know I've gotten to talk to thousands of people, and I've you know had a website and had you know thousands of people write to me. So I mean I just feel like. I mean, first of all, I, I know about a lot more different ferments. I've gotten a chance to experiment much more widely. But even more importantly, I've just gotten to hear people's stories about you know, what their grandparents did, you know, what they did in the old country that they came from, you know, the food that they think about all the time that they missed that they haven't been able to find in the US. And also the, the problems that people encounter. 
Um, so I, I feel like you know by, by answering troubleshooting questions uh, um, you know via my website for for a decade, I I have gained a lot of insight into what the typical problems do, whether it's you know, soft cucumbers or um, you know why doesn't my yogurt work after two or three generations or or, or things like that. So I mean the, the, the new book is just. You know, it's more in depth because you know my my knowledge has become more more in depth. But you know, really, mostly because you know I've gotten to talk to lots of people with the videos and also read a lot of books. You know, I, I, I had I had a, I had you know like two hours in the Vanderbilt University Library to like skim through uh, Dr. Steinkraus's book uh, when I wrote Wild Fermentation, and then I finally bit the bullet but I bought myself a copy. <laughs> Uh, and it has been such an indispensable resource for me. And, and there's just there's a huge literature of fermentation when you start you know looking around at you know what microbiologists have written, um, what um, you know, various social scientists have written. You know, I mean, I read this like you know brilliant dissertation um, about the economic consequences of factory production of sorghum beer in Botswana. Um, you know, and it turns out that you know in Botswana, um, you know, brewing beer was one of the you know best opportunities for for women to earn a decent living. And basically, you know, for moving it from community production to factory production, you know, has had huge economic repercussions for you know certainly for these women and you know and for the people dependent on them, you know, and for the communities that, that they live in. So, um, so anyway, you know, I mean, more practice, more conversations, more reading, and it's a decade later, and I have more to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, Little Bird told me that you're working on something with Patrick McGovern, and I'm wondering if you could divulge some details about that. Oh, that's so funny. A, 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 a little bird told her that I'm working on something with Patrick McGovern. I don't know. You know, we've had a nice correspondence. I mean, you know, he's he's someone I, I really admire. I, I mean, in June, I'm going to Philadelphia, and you know, uh, he's going to show me around. Uh, you know, the museum, um, and we're going to have lunch together. But maybe that'll turn out that we'll work on something. But I don't know about it yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I came a little late, so I'm sorry if you already addressed this. I'm just curious if. Um, your talk kind of touched a few times on the um, relationship of, of ferments to the body and, body and relationships to the body. I'm curious if you have any insights into um, different cultures' use of ferments and different cultures' relationships to decay, to death, to body function. You know, I'm thinking st stinky feet, smells like rot, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> wow, okay, that, that's, that's pretty big and broad. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I mean, you know, at the one level, there's, you know, sort of like, it's, it's, it's a pattern repeated across so many cultures that, um, um, you know, fermented foods, and in particular foods with live cultures, are, were just sort of like understood by folklore to be, you know, especially supportive of health, or, you know, or, or, or healing or magical foods in, in, in some way. Um, at another level, there's like, you know, talking about stinky cheeses or something. I mean, people are always likening, you know, stinky cheeses to various, you know, body parts and, and, and things like that. And, and, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the squeamishness that people have about certain fermented foods is that, you know, it's sort of like it, wor it's, it works that edge of what we're sort of like instinctively, um, um, Repulsed by uh, you know the the, the 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 smells of death and decomposition, but it, but it's sort of like working wor working that that edge. Um, but I don't really know how to answer that question. <laughs> 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 in a slightly different direction. So I'm curious. Um, I think you mentioned California, the Osmosis Day Spa. Uh, I mean, they basically like what, what, what they have is like tubs of rice bran and sawdust cultured and fermented and quite warm. 
And then, you know, one, one, once they're really active in generating heat, like they fill a tub with it, and there's a spa treatment where, you know, they, they, they basically like make a little space in the shape of, you know, you like laying down in it, and then you like lay down in it, and they cover you up, and it's incredibly hot. It's 140 degrees. I mean, that, well, the, I mean, the, 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 the temperature, if you just stick a thermometer in there is 140 degrees. Evidently, they, you know, it doesn't really heat your body to 140 degrees. You, I stayed in there for like, you know, about a half an hour or something. You know, you have like a, a host to, you know, comes and pampers you, like puts cold cloths on your forehead, gives you a little sort of bent straw with cold water to sip while you're in there. But I mean, it really is this amazing exfoliating feeling. I mean, it's literally like these bacteria you know, eating the dead skin off of your body. You know, it felt it felt really great, and I, I felt you know, really kind of like jelly when I got out. Of here. Um, about mineralizing the body as a health regimen for. Hundreds of years, people go to incredible water sources that have unique mineral compositions, and they drink these waters, they bathe in them. But um, we can look at these bacterial communities as another way to treat our entire body, not just our digestive tract, with a community of health. Well, and, and, and people also sometimes use um, um, uh, ferments medicinally as as poultices. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually met this uh, I met this elderly uh, 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 Russian-born woman in Australia when I was doing some workshops uh, um, up there in Melbourne, and she uh, she told me this great story that her her husband had uh, had had skin cancer, and it was it was like a cancer in his ear. And he was scheduled for surgery to have this cancer removed. And one night she had a dream. Her grandmother came to her in her dream and reminded her that in, 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 in Russia, um, you know, when, when, when people would have, um, you know, uh, an infection or any kind of like, you know, skin irregularity, they would put a poultice of sauerkraut on it. Um, so this woman, in, you know, in the morning she told her husband about her dream and he agreed to sort of let her put some poultices of sauerkraut sauerkraut, you know, on, on um, you know, this, this skin cancer in his ear, and it started shrinking, and then he ended up not having to have the, 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 um, the surgery. And, and, you know, it's, and it's well documented that sauerkraut, um, you know, has uh, 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 compounds called isothiocyanates that are, that are considered to be potent anti-carcinogenic compounds. So, you know, it, so it all kind of makes sense. Um, but, I mean, sure, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's all sorts, I mean, um, you know, I've heard of people uh, soaking their feet in vinegar to get rid of uh, fungal infections on their feet. You know, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of applications beyond just, you know, uh, 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 ingesting them to, um, you know, sort of, you know, use either the fermenting organisms themselves or their metabolic byproducts, you know, such as acetic acid, um, you know, in different kinds of um, topical medicinal ways. But yeah, that, and, and, and the Osmosis Day Spa, they didn't invent that. I mean, that's something that's, you know, done in Japan. Um, you know, from what I've been able to learn, it's, you know, something that was invented in this century in Japan. But, you know, it's practically like a, like a nuka pickle pot you get inside. <laughs> what are a few of your favorite foods? Yeah. That's so hard. What are my favorite fermented foods? Well, I don't know. You know, I feel like, you know, it's like... It's like, what are your favorite, you know, which is your favorite child or something? <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very devoted to sauerkraut. I mean, I really do love sauerkraut. Um, I really do love beer. Um, but, but I mean, I just like, I love experimenting. I mean, probably the, the, the fermented food that I, that I eat, you know, the most frequently is I make these like, uh, um, savory vegetable sourdough pancakes. So, you know, I don't know, sometimes I'll go for weeks where like twice a day, you know, my meal is, um, you know, some sort of a, you know, vegetable, maybe a little cheese, grated into my sourdough, mixed in with an egg, um, and I just, I make these, these, these pancakes, and I, like, I just never get tired of them. I, I just, I always bury them a little bit. I love to eat those. It was my favorite. I don't know. I love cheese. Oh my god. I, I mean, I guess I would have to say, like, a really sort of like creamy, creamy, strong flavored cheese. Um, um, you know, 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, but if I was going to be on a desert island with only, if I, if, I was, if I was stranded on an island with only one food, I would never take the sticky cheese. I mean, I'd, I'd probably stick with the sourdough pancakes or, or, or the sauerkraut, or, or both, you know. <laughs> so I'm curious, like, um, what would happen if you took your Dan and yogurt and you did a couple generations and it wasn't working for what if you just kept going? Would you, would, you know, would you get to a uh, new community quickly enough to would it take like 10 generations, 100, 1,000? That would be pretty. I don't know. I mean, evolution just isn't that predictable. I mean, if you have access to raw milk, I mean, you can just leave raw milk on the counter, and, and it will, you know, it will sour itself. You know, you'll have cultured milk, clabbered milk. Um, you know, but 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 in terms of like a you know a, a stable community, I mean, I don't think that that's that predictable. You know, how 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 long that would take. I mean, you know, I, I mean, just conceptual. I mean, you know, the, the first yogurt, you know, nobody had a starter. You know, the first yogurt was a spontaneous event that, that occurred somewhere. The first kefir was a spontaneous event that occurred somewhere that, you know, somebody especially liked and, 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 and you know, probably through some trial and error figured out how to propagate. Um, but, I, I mean, I just don't think that these, these, these events are, are, are that predictable. I mean, you know, in some environments you, you could leave out milk, you know, Every day for decades, and you know, just never get something that we like the taste of, or that you know, sort of turns into a stable community. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about microbiology. I, I like to be perfectly honest. I haven't, I haven't taken a biology class since ninth grade. Um, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've read a lot of literature, but I'm, 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 you know, kind of missing certain, you know, sort of underlying concepts, and uh, and I just don't know. But I think that it would be like very, very unpredictable. Like it could happen, um, you know. You know, you could leave out raw milk in your kitchen and, and actually turn out to have something that you love much more than yogurt or kefir. That you know could be the next big you know global sour milk product. But you know, the likelihood is it wouldn't. Well, you mentioned sourdough, so I'm just curious about the cultures that are available yeah, commercially. Yeah. So okay. So sourdoughs are really interesting, and in, 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 in a way. I would say that they're the exception to what I've been saying about stable communities because um, you know most of the research that I've found about sourdoughs, um, actually there's this New York State baker in the Hudson Valley, Daniel Weaver, who's written a, a, a couple of really great books about, about bread. And um, he was uh, out in California visiting a bunch of bakeries um, and you know somebody gave him some of their um, you know, famous San Francisco you know, sourdough starter. And so he did this thing where he sent some of it directly to a laboratory for some microbial analysis. And they took the rest of the um, um, sourdough that he was gifted with, you know, home on an airplane to New York State. He, um, uh, you know, he, he fed it a couple of times, baked some bread with it, and then took the starter that he had left and took some of that and sent it to the same lab for microbial analysis. And what he left California with wasn't what he had in New York a week later. Basically, the sourdough starter had had become his environment. So between the you know the, the flour that he was feeding to the sourdough and, and and you know all you know all grains have their own um, you know microbial ecosystem. You know be, be, between what's on the flour and what's in his bakery, you know basically the community in that sourdough was not stable. And yet, so so even though sourdoughs are really different. Uh, in different places depending on the environment, there's really only a couple of you know, different you know, genuses. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically the same genuses of organisms that are, or genera of um, organisms that are um, you know, found in sourdoughs around the world. So there's a lot of similarity, but it's never, it's never the same, and you don't really get the same kind of community stability as you do in you know, yogurt or tempeh or, 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 or kombucha or kefir or you know, some of these other um, um, types of, of, of ferments. So, uh, you know, I mean, I've mostly started sourdoughs just from, from scratch. Um, and then over the years, you know, different people have gifted me with, you know, their ancient family sourdoughs that, you know, somebody brought over from Europe with them and had been feeding, you know, over the course of generations. Um, 
But you know, really, ultimately, I found that they all end up tasting the same in my kitchen, and I just ended up like throwing them all together, and I just have this like bastard sourdough. That, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I, I just um, you know, for a little while, I was trying to maintain all these different sourdoughs, and then I just like realized like they all taste the same. <laughs> you know, as, as distinct as they might have been when somebody left Europe with them, you know, 150 years ago, or you know wherever they came from, you know, just, just in the environment of my kitchen, you know, and, and, and fed the same flour that I, that I used, they all, they all sort of, you know, became the same, and so I just decided to throw them all together. Is it the case, though, that, they, that it's not a stable community, or that it stabilized itself in your kitchen? Mm. Yeah, 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 sure. That, that it became its own local flower? Yeah, that, I mean, you can take back and I mean, it, someone yeah, I mean, except that, I mean, it seems like it's mostly about the substrate, like the flour that you feed it. So, um, you know, there's been some, some interesting, uh, you know, microbial analysis within a bakery. And so, like, the rye sourdough will be a little bit different profile than the wheat sourdough, because you get, you know, sort of slightly different populations of organisms, um, um, you know, proliferating, you know, on each of those different plants, yeah. Any, uh, any, any, any more burning questions for anyone? Well, I thank you so much for your interest. If any of you, uh, you know, want to buy copies of either of my books that already exist, um, uh, I have them right on that table. And I also have little postcards about how you wrote The Art of Fermentation. And, um, and I encourage you to please um, check that out um, when that comes out. And I thank you all for your, uh, for your interest and attention.